My guest today is Oveta Sampson. Oveta, how are you? I'm good. David, how are you? I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to meet you. I, uh, I understand that you are a teacher, among other things. Yeah, I'm an adjunct professor at DePaul University. I teach in the School of Design and uh, the, the CDM school, the Computer Digital Media School there. Uh, I usually teach graduate students, and I focus on design and designing ethical AI. Designing ethical AI. Yeah. Um, what's uh, not that's really good. originally I was going to uh, title this episode "Designing Ethical AI," and you corrected me. Yes, I did. You said, <laughs> "Don't call it that. Call it designing mindful AI." Yeah. And yeah. So let me let's just start with ethical AI. Let's 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 define these terms first. Yeah, I think the reason why people say ethical AI is because you know it comes from business ethics or media ethics or other types of industry ethics, medical ethics. And and then technology ethics has its own kind of rhythm. And then AI came about and people said, you know, we need uh, AI ethics. Um, and the reason why I, I tend to shy away from that term is because ethics is so loaded and ethics is also contextual. So this okay. idea of using a very universal technology and slapping your ethics on it versus my ethics, to say the to say the least, um, has obviously has has problems, right? And so sure. I like to term it in terms of of how we are deliberate in our design of machine learning enabled technology products and services, and that's why I call it mindful AI. Oh, okay. Being mindful about what we design. Okay, so mindful. Uh, it seems like it's it's deliberately vague. Yeah. Acknowledges that it's um we we're not making the decision. We're just uh, we're just saying that we have a decision to make. Whereas ethical suggests that there's these ethics out there we need to adhere to. But as you pointed out, your ethics may be different from my ethics, and maybe in the, our individual ethics may differ from the group's ethics. And yeah, so. I think you know if you if you study the the actual origin of the word ethics. You know, it it is a set of rules, but the but it's but it can be you know, especially normative ethics, which is what we practice. It can change based upon where okay. or where you, who sets the rules and and what and you know the communal organizations decides is ethical. Um, you know, there are people who feel that it's ethical to not have poor people have babies, right? They mm -hmm. think that that's a rule that should be followed, right? Well, I don't think that's ethical and that's not, certainly not moral. I so I, th I, I think, I know why we use the word because people tend to say, oh, I know what it means, but really they don't. Um, and, they, and they don't really agree sometimes on what it means, but it tends to have an umbrella to say, we should be doing the right thing. Okay, and another overloaded term is design. So in yes. in this context, what do you mean when you're saying design? So I like to say I use design as a verb. So there's two ways that you can think about design. Obviously, there's multiple ways, but I'm going to put it in a framework. One way is design as a noun. And so design is all about the look and feel and how we create the world or shape or how we um, um, color the world around us, right? So a, a chair exists and, and, and we decide that we're going to make it more comfortable or we're going to make it sturdy or whatever. So it's, it's all about the look and feel. So we're taking something that's kind of like made with technology or led with technology and we kind of like wrap something around it so that we have a better experience with it. I like to say that I use design as a verb and that it comes from uh, Victor Papanek, who was a famous um, a designer in the 1960s and 70s, who basically called design out uh, as being uh, uh, a bunch of lazy, 
look and feel people and felt like design could be used to have widespread social impact. And so Victor would say design is the purposeful uh, application of meaning and order to chaos. And, mm -hmm. and that implies uh, uh, action uh, and responsibility. And so when I teach students, uh, I, I, I kind of, and again, I'm paraphrasing his exact words, but I kind of uh, talk in the vein of design as a verb, where engineers, designers, researchers, data scientists, whomever is touching technology is mindful about the purposeful way that they're putting things together to impact society. So it's a verb not a noun. Right. And in the context of computer science, are we talking about the user interface and the user experience or are we talking yeah, about something talking, behind it as well? You know, design has evolved, right? So, you know, I don't know how much you know about the history of the design, but, but design is said to have started as an industry, you know, in the 16th century for Louis the, the 16th, right? He wanted a place to kind of like merchants and artisans would come together in quote unquote factories to design multiple at scale things for all of his largesse. And that is kind of known as kind of like the first industrial design factory in, in Paris. And then of course we had the French Revolution, but then we had the Industrial Revolution and that brought American in, into America into the design world. And so you had business, anthropology, design, engineering and technology all coming together. But historically design has been the application of science and technology. So you have researchers in labs saying, we can do this great stuff, but we don't have a purpose for it. And then you would have artisans, designers to come in and shape devices, things that you could translate the powerful you know, technology that could be accessed and used by people. And so design has always been this connector between science and technology and humanity. I see, okay. So we've got our definitions out of the way. Let's talk about yeah. mindful design and yeah. maybe, maybe a little bit of ethical design. Yeah, 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 of course, of course, of course. I think, I think um, I'm, I'm heavily influenced by J.C. Linklater, who was what I would say or what many people would say, the first computer scientist. He was, he was a, a, a mathematician, but he was also an audiologist. So he studied psychology, and he worked uh, uh, at Princeton University. But during the World War II, he worked for the military, like turning and all kinds of amazing scientists did in the fifties, because that was the way that they got a lot of money to do all this crazy research that they wanted to do while they were working for the military. And one of the ideas he had was the personal computer. So at that time in the fifties, a computer was the size of your room, right? Huge right. IBM, um, you know, we all saw war games, right? Like huge computers gotcha. where you stuck pieces of paper in there and that's how you program don't know how Bill Gates did it. So, artists, stacks of cards. Right, yeah. I mean, I would have just gave up if I had to do code that way. So, so JC Linklater and a bunch of other folks like Turning and and all Alan Turning and McCarthy, all these folks around the same time were saying there's got to be a way we can harness the computing power, right? At that time it was really expensive calculators, the computing power to make it personal. And his idea was, and he wrote it in a paper called Man and Computer Symbiosis, was this idea of a computer and a machine, a machine and man together augmenting each other to produce things. So in that paper, he kind of predicted things like the GUI interface, the mouse, speech to text. A lot of that stuff was what Xerox used to create the first GUI interface. We know now Steve Jobs made it famous, but um, uh, but Spark Labs, I think. Yeah, Spark Labs, all of that. But most of those those guys who were working, guys and gals who were working on that newfangled personal computer, trace a lot of their inspirations back to J.C. Linklater. 
And J.C. Linklater really was about the connection between man and machine. Uh, he wanted a speech to tech because he felt like CEOs couldn't type. They were too busy. So the machine should learn to, to, to understand speech so that it could, it could operate. And so for me, mindful AI isn't about, to me, AI isn't technology. It's a design tool. It's a, it's a tool that we could design our world around rather than a technology that we foist upon human nature. And so my my focus and my work is how do we design that man and computer symbiosis? What does it look like to have human-centered AI design and AI that is in service of human need? Mm -hmm. Rather than just technology, right? Like you, like the, we are going to come to a point in AI, the, the holy grail, of of from generative AI all the way up, right? From the from the automatic AI that's kind of dumb, right? Just <laughs> okay. it's, you tell it to do um, machine learning to machine learning to deep learning, where supervised and unsupervised, right? Like we don't have to tell it; it just kind of figures things out. Mm -hmm. All the way to generative, where it's it's supposed to mimic us and our that's information the robot process that you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm an Isaac Asimov fan, so I totally get. <laughs> I'm going in October, Butler will scare us all. So I think, but those are important things because, you know, Octavia Butler wrote about, and, and Isaac Asimov wrote about machines turning against us because he they knew that human nature has a dark side. And so mindful AI is mindful of that. <laughs> like we don't just say that, that the AI that we create is agnostic and it's totally separate from us. I like to say all data is created by people and all people create data. And th that truism really needs to, to be kind of shouted from the rooftops when people start thinking that the technology is bad. Technology isn't bad. We're bad. We can be bad. It's and so we need to design around that. Yeah, we need to design around that. And, and not try to figure out that AI is some pristine technology that, that, that is divorced from the things that we could put into it, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And so I don't blame algorithms, I, I'm, or I don't blame anybody. I'm just saying we need to be mindful about this tool that we're using to design a new world. I, uh, I think this is, we're starting to get into the ethics part of this then. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, the, this um, I came to mind, uh, I think Microsoft uh, had some sort of bot that was supposed to learn how to post on social media by reading other social media. Yeah, it ended up becoming a racist bot because that's yeah. what it saw <laughs> on social media. It was, it was in some ways, it was a success. Yes. But it was a terrible success. <laughs> it took 24 hours for that poor bot to become a racist douchebag. <laughs> just, just like the rest of the internet. Yeah. <laughs> And you know when it's I teach too harsh. <laughs> when I teach teens about um, we we do a I do an exercise with with teenage girls on um, designing algorithms. It's a it's an analog algorithm. They design it in the room. There's no Python used or anything, but they understand the fundamentals of how machine learning models are built. And one of the things that I try to tell them, I was like, we we go through training data and how they train their data and and train their model. I said, you know, once your model is released into the world, you're not the only one training it. Right. And that was a revelation to them when they started looking themselves up on social media. I'm like, yes, you post your own photos, but then there's other things that happen in your networks. And the model understands and learns that and spits out another outcome that maybe you don't think should be an outcome. Um, and so... So that's exactly what happened to the chatbot. Yes, we trained it to do one thing, but it got it learned a lot of stuff from a whole other bunch of people. Right. And that's why, you know, when I teach students, I said, you just have to be mindful of the system that you're putting your, your, your AI enabled tool or product and service in. Hmm. The ecosystem, right? Like it's not just a device and a human anymore. If we look at our iPhone, take away the hundreds of years of programming that's in there, but we just look at our laptop, It we type, we turn it on, it does what we want it to do. It acts in the way that we want. Um, AI learns. So 
our relationship with with the AI enabled laptop will be different in six months. Why? Because it's going to learn a lot from us. We have to yeah. be mindful of that. And I think as a developer, uh, uh, data science is less predictable. And yeah. Learning is less predictable because we can't just look at the code and follow through and say, okay, so right. this, will do this, this will do that because things change uh, and uh, the, the data input, for example, changes. Yeah, data scientists are, I always call them designers because they are constantly tweaking models because the model that they create today is going to be different tomorrow. It just is because that's what it is supposed to do. It's supposed to learn. And so, you know, when I was at IDEO, we, we had a list of, of what we call ethical AI principles, not my term, but one of them was listening for unintended consequences where we're building AI products and services that would listen for the bad learning, right? Like the, the listen for when the model isn't doing what we first predicted or designed it to do. Um, and building that in to the relationship with the machine and the human to be able to listen for those unintended consequences and then go fix them. Well, let's talk about fixing them. How, how do we resolve yeah. problems like this? Well, I mean, a lot of data scientists, uh, especially at large firms that depend on these models, um, um, iterative tweak them, right? So, so they don't set it in for, if they're good, if they're practicing good data science hygiene, they don't set it and forget it. And they're in a constant mode of what I call, um, uh, I won't say sanitizing, but I like to say very interested in the inputs that are going into their models. And this is where I think design really can have some influence, helping data scientists and model makers to understand the right inputs to lessen bias. I won't say eliminate it because as long as humans are making it, it's going to be biased, mm -hmm. but to lessen bias on the input and the outcomes and, and to really kind of look at how they evaluate the accuracy of models. I think that's another way that data scientists can affect um, um, the, uh, mindful AI by looking at what goes into their models and looking at the evaluation of the outcomes of their models. So for example, you know, I always say that bias answers AIs three ways. Human decisions about what data is collected, what data is stored and how it's classified. So a zip code is, is just a bunch of numbers, mm -hmm. but it can become a low-income neighborhood if sure. that's what you call it, right? right. Um, human decisions about, another way bias enters is human decisions about what data is used in training, designing, and creating AI models. So a lot of facial recognition software that is used in cars was trained on university students at Stanford. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't know how many university students at Stanford, how diverse that population is. So there's research to show that a lot of cars do not recognize people with darker skin. So, mm -hmm. um, and this happens a lot with LED lights and, and things that are triggered like, like a bathroom. So if you go in and there's been a lot of stories about this, but I'm going to tell you the technical part behind it. You go in you go into a bathroom and you put your hand under the faucet and the automatic faucet, which uses LED lights and sensors, senses a person there and water comes out. I go in and I have to do it like three or four times. Oh, uh, because your skin is darker. Because my skin is darker. It's tuned to my skin. Right. Yeah. And so that, that was trained on a very historical way of, just doing camera and lighting, right? Called Shirley cards. Uh, Kodak, when it went from black and white to color photography, want needed, I mean, anybody has white balanced the camera, you know that you need to get the camera right to, to get the right light. Otherwise, if it, if it takes a picture, it's gonna be too dark or too light or whatever. And so they need to color balance things. And so he had a poster of a woman named Shirley who was a brunette and very beautiful, but very white. And that became how they color balanced their new color photography at Kodak. And, and mm. those were the Shirley cards. And we had still have Shirley cards today, David. Mm. 
right? Like it's still used in 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 Vogue and 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 that 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 foundational technology is still used to color balance. And so that's why you could still take a photo of, I could still take a photo of somebody in my family and, and it's super dark. And that, that kind of foundational, um, um, some people would say racism. I would just say unmindful AI um, <laughs> is, or, or unmindful design is transferred to AI, right? Like that's how bad yeah. bias gets there. Right. So the led light is just, it's just the sensor is just going off of years of color balancing, right? But if you're mindful about it, you might say, you know, we've changed a lot since the 1960s. Sure. I'm, right? I'm guessing everyone in that Kodak room were white males. Yes. <clears throat> they all looked, so their skin looked like Shirley's skin. And there and, was uh, So it didn't, it didn't occur to them. Right. The it rest was of the world didn't look like them. And in some ways, uh, I've been in a lot of... Um, software development shops where everybody looked the same as well. Yes. You know, people of color are underrepresented, women are underrepresented. Right. And uh, so that same mindset can be a danger. Yeah. And I think, look, the reason why I'm so, I'm so vested in this is the speed and scale of AI. Right. So Kodak with a camera in the 1960s, boy, how many people were buying cameras? But today, if you create a model on Facebook or Google, you know, YouTube, it has wide ranging impacts on very last too. Very, yeah, very lasting impacts on very diverse people sets. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not if we don't have diverse people in the room raising their hand to say, are we using the right tra training data here? Why are we using a neural network model when we can't, which means we can't audit it, right? Because we don't actually know how they're making those nodes and how they're connecting uh, versus a regression model, which is more interpretable, right? Like we can tell how the how the model became to, to spit out the outcome. Um, if you don't have somebody in the room saying that, then then you don't know until, until the bot starts spewing racist propaganda right like until the outcome and i believe that mindful ai starts in the model making not in the experience or the outcome hmm. that's where design really starts that's where the ethics really starts otherwise it's some drive-by kind of checklist ethics thing yeah that looks great and you're like okay maybe right like how do you know <laughs> like you can't <laughs> even see the model now right Right. And so so we know that bias gets in by training data or the way that it's designed, but also human decisions about what data is ignored. Right. Mm -hmm. So if 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 black folks are in your training data, right, for your sensor, then obviously it's get your car or your whatever product is going to have problems recognizing those folks, which is why. AI need we need to be mindful about AI use cases. Using facial recognition to put somebody in jail is a risky use case. Why? Because facial recognition has its limitations based upon the model, based upon the data, based upon the input. And so unless you're really sure that everybody in that mama was in that training model, <laughs> you know that that facial recognition software is going to make a mistake, which is why a Detroit man is suing the Detroit Police Department today. Uh, luckily, that sort of thing never happens in Chicago. Right. Of course not. I mean, predictive <laughs> policing. I mean, Chicago has its own minority report, right? It has the hits list. It has four <laughs> citizens put on a list from an algorithm that people had to sue to see they wouldn't even show us the model in oh. Chicago. And I could have been on this. You could have been on this. Nobody knew who was in my list. And these were not people who all those people did not commit crimes. That's why it was so, called the pre-crime list. This is they like the authority report, isn't it? Yeah, it was totally, it was, it was called the strategic subjects list. And these were people that the police wanted to follow um, to see the algorithm said that they were most likely to commit a crime. Robert McDaniel was on this list, had never been in, in trouble before, and 
he, the ACLU and some journalists kind of was like, hey, wait a minute, how did he get there? He got there because of his social networks. But it took a while for us to even get access to the model. The police didn't even want us to have it. And the Chicago police had a strategic subject list of pre-crime people. Like, what the hell is that? That's that's, pro- that's profiling. Well, that's that's robotic profiling. Yeah, and that's it may, may not be racially based, but it's right. based on something other than actually committing a crime. I mean, then they release the number. They release the 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 list with no PII, right? There's just mm-hmm. male subject, whatever. And I and I think they did have race. So of course it it was it was disproportionately uh, black and Latino. But but one of the things we have to be mindful of is what I what is the cognitive biases that we have as humans. So this is where design comes in. Mm. I have an HCI degree. So a lot of what I know about design and interactions, a human computer interaction degree is about how humans behave with technology, right? We, we behave differently with machines than we do with each other. And we have these biases that shortcuts that our brain cognitively uh, make when we're dealing with machines. One of those biases is automation bias. Um, mm. People always say, oh, I, people don't trust AI, blah, blah, blah. Really? Really? When was the last time you used a check, right? Or, yeah. you, or you paid something with money or whatever. People yeah. trust uh, digital electronics and machines all the freaking time, right? right? There are people who, who would leave their kid in an Uber that drove itself if they could. <laughs> now, I'm not judging that. I'm just saying... Let's not get it twisted about our cognitive laziness. Right. And it's just that we have a lot of stuff in our brains. And so if a machine does something right nine times out of 10, we're just going to be like, that machine knows what it's doing. When was the last time you questioned Google Maps? Yeah, no, I think a a really good example is um, self-driving cars. There's a risk in self-driving cars, self-driving cars. I think somebody, the one hit, hit somebody not too long ago. Uh, yeah, they're well, in a tree, and, and, and they're deciding ahead. whether somebody was driving or not. Is it is it is it safe? Is it not safe? Well, is it? I think the bigger question is: Is it safer than a human in a car? That's really the question we need to ask. Well, I think. Well, first of all, I I think I think humans make mistakes as well. Yeah, I think I think it. I think a self-driving car would be safer than any human in a car if there were no humans in the cars. If it was just, uh, there's still people on the sidewalk, though. Because we can program machines to do what machines are supposed to do, but we can't program humans. We just do whatever the hell we want to do sometimes, right? And we are the factor here. We're we're the we're the X factor. We're the we're the unpredictable algorithm. We are a human algorithm. AI is built upon our information processing, but the. But the problem that Alan and his team got wrong in 1956 when they went to Dartmouth and decided to create AI was that they made AI way rational than, 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 than humans will ever be. Just ask an economist, right? Or ask a parent of a teenager. I don't know why my team does the things that he or she does, but their brain development stunts them and they act weird. And so AI though, cars, we can program a car to do exactly what we want it to do. We can't program people. And that's why we have to be mindful about the AI that we that we create, because in some sense, it's going to interact with an irrational human being. Right. Somebody's gonna cross the street in the middle of the road without uh so we can can crosswalks. Just throw a ball out there and go chasing it, right? And it has and, to deal with that. Right. And so I think we we have to stop this idea that AI means no human or AI means better than human and start thinking about AI with human. What does that relationship look like? AI isn't all knowing and neither is the human and maybe together they can hobble together some goodness. Yeah. That's what that's what the man in computer symbiosis is about. Oveta, we're just about out of time. Is there yes. anything you haven't talked about that you think we should have? No, I think I think we're on a frontier of of a new way to design products with AI. 
I think we will drop our silos between disciplines. We will have what I call transdisciplinary acumen among data scientists, designers, and engineers, and developers, all working together on, on this new tool to design a new world. Well, that it's been a pleasure talking with you. And yes, I hope to meet you in person when you come back to Chicago. Yeah, yeah. I thank you for allowing me to, to do this. I, I really enjoyed it. Well, it's been quite the pleasure to talk about technology with new friends.